for being here for the 2023 Teaching Fellows Institute Parent and Community Talk. We're here with Andrew Watson from Learning in the Brain. He's here with our fellows for two days in Charlotte, North Carolina, and we're greatly appreciate, appreciative of him spending time with us tonight. Andrew Watson began teaching in 1988, studying psychology and neuroscience in 2008, and combining those interests in 2012. Having taught high school English for 20 years, Andrew now translates brain science for teachers, students, administrators, and parents. As a consultant, he has partnered with schools and presented at conferences, both nationally and internationally. Focusing on memory, attention, and motivation, his goal, use research in cognitive psychology and neuroscience to make learning easier and teaching more effective. Since 2016, Andrew has written and edited the Learning in the Brain blog, he has also written three books, The Goldilocks Map, Learning Begins, and Learning Grows. With that, I'll pass it over to Andrew. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Um, as you heard Barbara say, I spend a lot of time traveling the country and uh, talking primarily with teachers and with students. Uh, and I always offer to schools, you know, if you like, I'd love to love a chance to talk with the parents as well. And schools are sometimes interested and sometimes that doesn't happen. So I was delighted when Barbara mentioned that this is a, a part of the opportunity. So I spent, as you heard, I spent uh, all day today and we'll spend all day tomorrow talking with this really wonderful group of teachers that Barbara has put together. Um, and I'm especially delighted to have a chance to talk to parents as well. As you heard uh, Barbara say, I've been a longtime classroom teacher. I started uh, as a high school English teacher in 1988. Uh, and in 2008, I read on the side of a cereal box that learning happens in the brain, uh, which, of, of course, because I'm an English teacher, nobody tells me that sort of thing. Um, so I thought, you know, gosh, if it's true that learning happens in the brain, then maybe if I knew more about how the brain works and how the mind works, then that sort of research from the world of science would be helpful to me as a teacher. And uh, it's been a great help to me in my own classroom teaching work. And I've really enjoyed discussing it over the last uh, more than a decade now, uh, in, uh, discussing that with classroom teachers. And I'm really delighted to have a chance to talk with you as well. So uh, with that said, let me switch over and show you some slides. And Barbara, can you just confirm for me that my slides have come up? Okay, great. That sometimes that happens, sometimes that doesn't happen. Okay, so what I wanna do is start with a quick exercise. Uh, and what I want you to do is to imagine that um, after this session, you went and you asked your children and you said to them, oh, children, uh, I'm so curious about this. I I've heard you say before um, that you have trouble paying attention in school. And, and honestly, perhaps I've noticed at home that sometimes you have trouble paying attention to sorts of academic things. So, oh, children, could you explain to me why do you find it hard to pay attention in school? Why do you find it hard uh, to pay attention to your academic work at home? So imagine you were to ask your children this question. Uh, could you please go ahead and type into the chat what would their answers be? How would they explain to you why it is that they have trouble paying attention? I'll be quiet and let you do that. I've got a boring, I've got another boring, I've got a third boring. There's a lot of boring here. <laughs> the parents are boring too. <laughs> so another thing I'd rather be doing. Oh, that's a, I'm a high school teacher. All no is a, is a favorite answer of, um, of students everywhere. Yeah, distracted is definitely a thing. Okay, I'm going to guess that more answers are going to pile up while I'm talking. <clears throat> but in my experience, that's a pretty easy question to, to answer when you ask teachers, when you ask parents, why is it that your children have trouble paying attention? Um, there are lots and lots of reasons. It's pretty easy to identify why it is that paying attention is hard. So I think the uh, first lesson we get from that uh, if we were to summarize this in two newspaper headlines, I think our newspaper headlines would be that we understand what the problems are. You just listed a lot of the problems, and the more people who add things into the chat, <laughs> the more problems we'll understand. So the reason that we as teachers, the reason that you as parents want to go talk to the research people, 
is to find out solutions to these problems that we understand so well. So I'm now going to say a wildly counterintuitive thing, which is uh, perhaps the most shocking thing I'm going to say during all of today. Uh, and that is we actually have these headlines backwards, which is to say, the problem is that we really misunderstand what attention is. And once we understand what attention really is, we actually kind of already know what some of the solutions are. And both of these claims are really quite astonishing claims, but I, I hope to be able to follow up on them uh, in a way that will be helpful to you. Um, I do want to say, by the way, that um, often people are inclined to take notes while I talk, and if you want to do that, that's a perfectly fine thing to do. And even better, if you'd rather not distract yourself with note-taking, at the end of the talk today, I'm going to put up one slide, and the one slide that I'm going to put up is going to contain all of the important information from everything I'm going to say for the for the whole talk. So if you want to just wait, uh, you can take a picture of that slide or you can do a screen capture of that slide at the end. So that way you, you can take notes if you want to, but you don't have to. You can just focus and concentrate. Um, that would be a fine thing to do as well. OK, so I've made this quite astonishing claim that the that the key surprise here is that we don't understand what attention is. What I think most people think is that attention is a thing and we want our students to give us their attention. We want them to pay attention. And that's actually not what it is at all. There is no attention center in the brain. There's no one part of the brain that does attention. Instead, attention is a behavior that is the result of three other mental processes happening effectively. So if the one thing is happening and the second thing is happening and the third thing is happening, all three of those things are happening, then the behavioral result is something that we call attention, but I can't get directly to attention itself. So if I say, Barbara, I really need you to pay attention. What just happened is I just told Barbara to do three different things, but I didn't tell her which one she isn't doing and I didn't tell her how to do it. So perhaps it's your experience that telling your children to pay attention doesn't really help very much. It certainly doesn't help very long. And, and that's why saying pay attention is sort of very temporarily fixing the symptom, but it's not getting at the underlying problem. And the underlying problem is at least one of those three processes. So what we need to know is we need to know, well, what are these magical three underlying processes? And what do they look like? And how do I fix them when they're broken? That's that's what we need to know. Um, so uh, here they are. I'll tell you what they are. So the first of the three is called alertness. And the second of the three is called orienting. We're tempted to call it orientation, but that's something else. We're talking about orienting. Uh, and unhelpfully, the, the third process is called executive attention. And I accept that that's a somewhat um, unhelpfully confusing name, but that's what it's called. So we're just going to go ahead and call it executive attention. So alertness, orienting, and executive attention. Uh, so let's define those three things and talk about what problems with them look like, especially in the classroom, which is the world I know best. Uh, so to define alertness, I, I think the easiest way to define alertness is that it's basically alertness. It's this very rare moment in the field of psychology where the actual everyday definition aligns quite nicely with the psychological definition. It simply means how much physiological energy are children bringing to whatever it is that they're doing right now. Uh, and in schools, there are exactly two alertness problems. This is the first alertness problem, and this is the second alertness problem. Uh, I myself am a high school teacher, so the problem that I struggle with in my classes is, is that my students don't have enough alertness. They tend to be drooping and dragging, so that's an alertness problem. Uh, and teachers who work with younger grades, they typically tend to see this problem, which is to say there's too much alertness is the problem. Oh, I overclicked. <clears throat> uh, notice, crucially here, 
Uh, this child does not have an attention problem. He has an alertness problem. And if I try, try to solve it as an attention problem, it's not going to help because it's not an attention problem. It's an alertness problem. This is an alertness problem. It's not an, uh, uh, it's not an attention problem. It's alertness. This student, these students have way too much alertness for them to be able to do the kind of work that I want when I want them to pay attention. Uh, so that's the first of the three mental processes we call it alertness. The second, orienting, has to do with the, um, the stuff that the student is focusing on. So the technical definition here is perception of stimuli in the environment. So in the environment around us at, at every moment, there's all sorts of stuff that we could be focusing on. Um, so this is one of the, uh, I think, most fun um, ways of thinking about this problem. Uh, so the big blue rectangle represents all of the stimuli in the environment around you that you could be focusing on. And the little bitty rectangle down here in the corner, this little bitty white rectangle right there, which you probably didn't even notice, uh, that represents our cognitive capacity to choose among all of those stimuli. That's, that's the percentage that we can in fact focus on at any one moment, that we can orient to at any one moment. Uh, and of course, the precise calculations here are a little tricky to figure out, but this is, I think, one clever way to represent it. So for instance, um, if I were to ask you right now, how does your left ankle feel? You could answer that because the stimuli, you know, your bodily stimuli can tell you how your left ankle feels, and those stimuli have been there all along. But it's actually incredibly unlikely that you were orienting to that information until I ask you about it. If I ask you what color is the floor right now, you could tell me because those stimuli are there, but you weren't orienting to them uh, until I asked this question. So part of what's so tricky in the world of school for students is knowing which of the available stimuli to orient to. Uh, so for instance, if I were um, showing you this picture uh, and I asked you, um, isn't this a fun picture? I really, this is sort of an aspirational goal for me that maybe someday my students will pay attention quite this much. So if I were to ask you what it is that the children are looking at uh, at this moment, I think it's highly likely that you would be able to answer the question and you would say something like beetles. Uh, however, if instead of asking you that question, I asked you what color is this, uh, is the shirt uh, that this, uh, this girl is wearing, I actually think it's highly unlikely you would be able to answer that question <clears throat> when I do this exercise with with live people in a room, uh, sometimes one or two people answer correctly out of you know, 50 or 100, but uh, often nobody answers correctly. So in this case, uh, depending on what your screen resolution is, the answer is something like orange. Uh, but notice here, if I were at this moment to say something like, well, I'm really disappointed in you that you weren't paying attention, I, I think you would be a little frustrated by that comment. You would say, well, wait a minute, I was paying attention. The, you didn't have an attention problem. You were orienting to this perceptual stimuli right here, and you just didn't orient to this perceptual stimuli over here. Uh, and when I tested you on this, you were probably good at identifying that. And when I tested you on this, um, it's unlikely you correctly identify that as orange uh, because you didn't orient to it. But that's not an attention problem. It's an orienting problem. So we have an introductory sense of what an alertness problem might, might be. We have an introductory sense of what an orienting problem might be. What about uh, an executive attention problem? Uh, and this is the most abstract of the bunch. So we'll talk about this one for a little while. <clears throat> so the technical definition of executive attention is effortful control of cognitive processes, effortful control of cognitive processes. And notice, in the world of orienting, I'm just perceiving. I'm not actually doing much with the perception. I'm just sort of taking the environmental information in. But when I switch from taking the information in to actually doing something with the information, I've now switched from the world of orienting to the world of executive attention. Uh, and I want to give you two uh, kinds of examples of this. So the first of these <clears throat> is, is sort of fun to do. Uh, and if you've taken a psychology course in college, perhaps you, you've almost certainly done this. Uh, so what I'm going to do in just a moment is I'm going to put words in each one of these boxes. Uh, but actually, the word themselves don't really make any difference. What matters is you can see that each of these words is in a different color. 
So what I'm going to ask you to do, and, and you do have to do this out loud if you want to do it sub vocally so you don't seem, you know, you're talking to your computer, which would be strange. Um, but I'm going to ask you to do this sub vocally. You're going to say out loud the colors. So when you see this word, you would say pink. It doesn't matter what the word says. Uh, and when you see this, you would say green. It doesn't matter what the word says. You're going to say the color, not the word. Um, and then down here in the corner, there's going to be a timer. And what you want to do is once you've said out loud what all of the word colors are, you want to see how long that took you. Uh, because Barbara is actually very competitive and she's going to try to beat all of you. So your goal in this case is to do this uh, correctly and to do it faster than Barbara does it. So again, say the color, not the word. Uh, and once you're done, check the timer to see if you have in fact uh, beat Barbara. So everybody ready? This is very exciting. You have to say it out loud. Hey, Mark, get set, go. <clears throat> okay, so I hope you checked your time. Um, it looked to me like Barbara was done. Barbara was at 13 seconds you got done there. So, so we'll see whether or not um, <clears throat> you managed to meet Barbara. Um, so now, actually, I lied. This was just a warm-up round. This was just a, a practice round. The goal isn't really to beat Barbara. The goal is to beat yourself, because now we're going to go ahead and we're do exactly the same thing again. I'm going to put words uh, in the boxes. You're going to say the color, not the word. And of course, since you've had a chance to practice this, you should be better the second time than the first time, because you had a chance to practice. So the first time you were trying to beat Barbara, the second time you're trying to beat yourself. So the question is, how much faster are you the second time than the first time? So again, say the color, not the word. And again, check the timer down in the corner when you're done. Uh, and we'll see how much faster you are. OK, uh, everybody ready? <clears throat> you mark. It's it. Okay, and again, I hope you checked your time. <clears throat> and as sort of if you take a minute to calculate how much faster you were uh, the second time than the first time, I suspect you're likely to answer that question. I've been talking all day, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> I suspect you're going to answer that question by saying, actually, the second time was a whole lot harder than the first time. Uh, and in fact, it's perfectly normal. If it took you twice as long the second time as the first time, that's a perfectly normal result. Uh, and here's why. So when you did this version of the task, so for instance here, when you were looking at this word right here, uh, if you have color perception, your color perception brain perceived red, uh, and because you can read English, your reading brain said red. So both the color perception part of your processing and your reading processing gave you the same answer, so you just said it. Whereas when you did this version, your color perception gave you one answer and your reading, the reading part of your processing gave you a different answer. There was a conflict between those two. So now you had to effortfully control your cognitive processes. You had to say you had to answer this way rather than that way. And because you had to do that, there was an extra amount of executive attention. So we basically timed, well, how much time, the difference between those times was how much does it take for you to do executive attention in this particular in this particular research paradigm. <clears throat> so this is sort of conceptually speaking what we mean when we say executive attention. This is effortful control of cognitive processes. Um, what does this look like in the classroom? And this actually turns out to be considerably trickier to think about, uh, but I have an answer. It took me a while to figure this out, but I rather like my answer. So I'm an English teacher, so I always default to uh, English sorts of examples. So let's say I've spent the week teaching a grammar unit. We're doing parts of speech. Um, so uh, at the end, I want to see how much my students have learned. So I put this sentence up on the board uh, and I say, OK, what part of speech in this sentence, what part of speech is the word poodle? Barbara. 
and Barbara looks at me and Barbara looks at the sentence on the board and Barbara looks at me and Barbara says, well, poodle is a noun. <clears throat> so I got bad news and I got good news. The bad news is Barbara is wrong. Poodle is definitely not a noun in this sentence. Poodle is describing what kind of hotel it is. It's a new hotel. It's a fancy hotel. It's a poodle hotel. And because it's describing a noun, that means it's an adjective. It just it is. It's an adjective. So Barbara is wrong. But the good news is that Barbara's wrong answer is incredibly plausible. It's a perfectly reasonable, you totally get why she thought it was a noun, because almost always poodle is a noun. It's just almost always a noun, it just is. So in this case, the problem is that Barbara got the answer wrong, but I'm not actually super worried that she got it wrong. It's a perfectly reasonable mistake to make. Like, we'll talk about it for a while and she'll absolutely understand why it's an adjective, not a noun. But so let's imagine instead, I say, okay, uh, in this sentence, what part of speech is the word poodle? Barbara. And Barbara looks at me and she looks at the sentence and she looks at me and she says, well, a poodle is a metaphor. So now we have a completely different kind of problem because metaphor is never, <laughs> never the right answer to a part of speech question. A, a metaphor is a figure of speech. It's not a part of speech. So the problem is not just that Barbara is wrong although she is, the problem is that Barbara is in entirely the wrong ballpark. She's just, she's not even thinking about this question the way she ought to be thinking about it. So I think an executive attention problem is not just when the student is wrong, but when the student is thinking the wrong way. And that's a subtle distinction, but I think that's the best way. It's the one that I find most people land on as a way to think about, well, that's what an executive attention problem looks like in school. And I'll give you a couple more examples of this. Uh, so let's imagine I give my student an exponent question like this. <clears throat> uh, so if the student says this, the bad news is the student is wrong. So, you know, that's, that's not great. But the good news is the student basically gets that exponents are about multiplication. So the multiplication isn't exactly happening correctly, but I'm, I'm in the right operation, so we're good. If, however, the student says this, or the student says this, or the student says this, okay, the student has fundamentally misunderstood the whole concept of even the way exponents operate. We're, we're in completely other uh, mathematical operations here. <clears throat> so the problem is not the student is wrong, the student is thinking the wrong way. Or another example, I actually got this as a question. I was at a school in Japan, and a teacher asked me, uh, a kindergarten teacher asked me, so maybe uh, if she's reading the picture book and she shows the children the, <clears throat> the picture and she says, well, what is Charlotte doing in the picture? Uh, so this is the wrong answer. And this is the executive attention problem answer. Although I'm here to tell you, this is not only a kindergarten problem. Uh, as a high school teacher, I teach 10th grade mostly. Uh, and I get this sort of problem all the time. <clears throat> so again, this is fairly abstract, but uh, that's how I think about executive attention. So the headline here is if, in fact, the student is at an appropriate level of alertness and the student is orienting to the stimuli I want him or her to orient to, and the student is thinking about it the right way, the behavioral result of that is, in fact, this thing called attention. Now, Barbara sent me a list of questions that people had, uh, and a lot of them focused on one topic that I don't actually usually cover when I talk with parents, but since this question came up so much, I thought I would add this piece. <clears throat> so I'll do this a little briskly, but I think this will be helpful. So what I want to do uh, is draw a picture of what I just said. So I'm going to consider this rectangle that I've drawn here. I'm going to think about this as the quote-unquote attentional field. Uh, and in this attentional field are all the things students might orient to. So they could perhaps uh, orient to the classmate next to them or to the fact that they're hungry uh, or to the shiny thing in the hallway or who knows, maybe they are in fact orienting to, to, to what I'm talking about, that's possible. Uh, and at every second I can graph how, uh, how salient each of these stimuli might be. So at this particular second for this student, the most salient thing here is the shiny thing in the hallway, and the second most salient thing is lunch, uh, and the least salient thing is, is what I'm talking about, is how we think about this. 
Uh, and I can overlay on this the student's alertness level. So if the student is moderately alert, a nice uh, middle level of alertness there, what you can see is that this, this alertness line creates a kind of a threshold. And in this case, uh, two of the stimuli are crossing the threshold. So this student is consciously aware of being hungry uh, and consciously aware of the shiny thing. Uh, but all of these other things are below the level of consciousness. So for instance, when I asked you how your left ankle feels, well, those stimuli were there, you just weren't orienting to them at that moment that was below your level of consciousness. Now, if the student is at a very low level of alertness, I'm going to I'm going to put a low level of alertness over here. Well, as you can see at this point, none of the stimuli is salient enough. This student is functionally asleep. Really, nothing is salient enough to cross that threshold. Whereas uh, if the student is at a very high alertness level, well, now all of the stimuli in the environment are salient and the student is processing everything all at the same time. <clears throat> So obviously, as teachers, our goal is, is to start by getting students to a moderate alertness level. Uh, and if we are successful at doing that, our next goal is to rebalance all of these stimuli. So we want to reduce the salience of the bad stuff, all the distracting stuff, and we want to increase the salience of the important things that we're focusing on. And then once we've done that, well, now we want to help our students to think effectively about this piece right here. So we want to help them with their executive attention about the one thing, the class topic, that has cleared this uh, salience uh, alertness threshold. <clears throat> and if we succeed, it, it looks sort of like this, uh, I hope. So the reason I've gone through all this is the question that came up multiple times in the list of questions that Barbara sent me um, is to ask about ADD and ADHD. And there are two answers to questions uh, about ADD and ADHD. Uh, and the first really important answer to the question is my area of expertise is typical cognition, not atypical cognition. So I'm not an expert in the field of ADD and ADHD. Uh, and I don't want to pretend to be because I'm not. I probably know more than, than many people do, but uh, expertise in this field, I cannot and do not claim. The second thing is I actually have a way of thinking about ADD, which I find helpful. And when I talk with people about it, they say, that makes sense. So I will share it with you. So I've already said that this is way too much. If all of the stimuli are over the alertness threshold, ah, people can't focus. That's just overwhelming. And for most people, the goal is to have a nice moderate alertness level. So only a few of the stimuli are over that threshold right now. So on the one hand, that is true. And on the other hand, uh, when I said that's true for most people, well, it's not true for all people. People are different. And some people have different thresholds that feel comfortable. And in particular, I think most people who are in the world of ADD and ADHD their comfort level is actually more here. What they need is a greater level of environmental stimulation in order to feel comfortable. So the reason for the clicking and the reason for the tapping and the reason for the wandering and the reason for the talking and the reason for the bouncing and all of those things, what they're trying to do is to get to a stimulation level that feels comfortable for them, even though for most of us, this is a more comfortable alert, uh, uh, stimulation level. So as a teacher, what I do is I tamp down all of the stimulation and get it to a relatively unstimulating environment. And that's helpful for most of my students, but for my students who are more comfortable here, what they need to do is click the pen so there's enough stimulation. They need to bounce in the chair so there's enough stimulation. So this, by the way, is why it is uh, that for students with ADD on medication, that medication is typically a stimulant, which on the one hand seems wildly counterintuitive. But the reasoning here is if I give a stimulant to someone with ADD, ADHD, they will perceive more stimulation in the environment uh, simply because the, stimula the, the stimulant that they're taking is increasing the amount of stimulation they're getting from the environment. So they will feel more comfortable that way. So although I'm not an expert in this field, this is how I think about ADD and ADHD, uh, and I found it helpful, and uh, other people have shared feedback that they do as well. Oh uh, yeah, I saw this on Twitter just a little while ago. Um, someone, this is a person I follow on Twitter, uh, and she says that when she needs really to concentrate in a meeting, 
What she needs to do is to keep her hands busy so that she can concentrate. So what she did during this very important meeting uh, is she held up her left hand and she drew her left hand with her right hand. Uh, and because she was drawing with her right hand, that hand activity allowed her to concentrate. <clears throat> okay. So the goal is to start by moderating alertness levels and then to reduce all the distracting -y things and then to increase the salience of the class topic and then to help students with executive attention. Now, when I talk with teachers about this, that's typically a three or a four hour presentation. Tomorrow, I'm gonna talk about teachers, talk about this with teachers, it's gonna be the whole morning. Um, so I'm not gonna do sort of the speeded up movie version of a three hour thing. I'm just gonna give you a couple quick examples of how this translates into some teaching practice. <clears throat> so uh, our first interest, oh, I'm sorry, here we go. Uh, our first interest <clears throat> is this thought process that I think we have to go to go to something like this. And I still do this after all these years. What I find is that I, I turn to the student and I say, oh, for heaven's sakes, Barbara, will you please pay attention? And I think, oh no, the fact that I just told Barbara she has to pay attention means I'm thinking about this the wrong way. What I need to do is stop. It's not gonna help to tell Barbara to pay attention. Instead, what I need to do is think differently about this set of circumstances I'm seeing right here. So I need to ask myself, well, does Barbara have an alertness problem? And if the answer is yes, then I should solve the alertness problem. Well, if it's not alertness, maybe it's an orienting problem. And if it's an orienting problem, then I should solve the orienting problem. And if it's neither of those two things, maybe it's an executive attention problem, it's in which case I'll solve the executive attention problem. But I can't solve the attention problem. There is no attention problem. I need to solve the problem in one of those three sub processes. And the only way to do that is to identify it first. <clears throat> so let's imagine that I say, oh gosh, this is clearly an alertness problem. What are the sorts of things that we can do to solve alertness problems? So when I talk with teachers, I just say, well, you've been solving alertness problems for years. What are some of your go-to solutions to alertness problems? Um, and teachers will have lots and lots of good ideas. So one idea that always comes up when I talk with teachers about alertness is allowing students to move. Uh, and if, they're, if they've got too much alertness and they need to let off some energy, well, recess is a great idea. They can go and let off all their excess energy and then they come back uh, and they're now at a much better alertness level. Or as a high school teacher, if they're all asleep, um, I often will get students writing on the board. We'll, we're having a conversation. I say, okay, I need four sentences on the board. One, two, three, four, go write your answer on the board. Well, now they're standing up writing on the board. <laughs> Their alertness level has gone up because they had to move. So something as simple as that can change uh, a student's alertness level. Uh, one uh, strategy that people tend not to think of as an alertness strategy, but for evolutionary reasons is an alertness strategy, is we are, um, I don't often use the word hardwired, but we are basically cognitively hardwired to alert to visual novelty. If there's some new visual stimulus in the room, that means we're gonna look at it. We just kind of have to do that. We have to wake up and, and focus. Um, so this means, for instance, in the school where I have worked, we used to uh, have Saturday classes. I used to get paid cash money uh, to teach grammar to 15-year-olds at 8, 10 on a Saturday morning. Uh, so you, you can imagine what their alertness level was like. So what I would do at 8, 09 is I would just have a stash of high-energy videos, and when the students came in, I would have one playing. I've got videos of people racing bicycles down mountains. I've got videos of puppies mobbing the adorable children. I've got videos of people doing pogo stick tricks. It doesn't really matter as long as it's high energy and visual. So my students sort of drag themselves into the room and then they see the video and boop, they wake right up and their alertness level moderates quite quickly. And on the one hand, um, my, my department head boss might say to me, you know, Andrew, we're paying you money to teach them grammar, not to show them videos. And my rejoinder would be is, well, they're not gonna learn any grammar if their alertness level is so low, they can't possibly, it's not gonna happen. So what I'm doing is I'm using cognitive science to wake them up enough to get their alertness level up to a level where they can in fact pay attention to the grammar that I need to teach them. So something as simple as that is as something as simple as encouraging movement, something as simple as introducing visual novelty. These are the sorts of strategies that we as teachers can use 
um, to help students uh, on this path towards paying attention. <clears throat> uh, what about orienting is, is the next question. Um, and this, I think, is really uh, directly applicable to parent world because part of the problem for orienting is if there are distractions, well, by definition, a distraction is something that is disorienting the student. So in teacher world, this is actually something of a problem. Many, many, many teachers, especially uh, elementary school teachers, K3, K4 teachers are trained to decorate, decorate, decorate classrooms. Uh, and if you visited classrooms, you've perhaps seen this. Uh, and <clears throat> there are reasons that that happened, uh, mostly having to do with a misunderstanding of, of research. But we've done a lot of research on this particular question in recent years. Uh, and that research is really increasingly persuasive that this level of decoration, in fact, disorients students and does, in fact, get in the way of their learning. Uh, and the most recent study I saw was really very helpful, a question I would show teachers research on this, and they would say, well, yes, that's true in the short term, but surely the students get used to the distractions, like sh surely after a while it's not distracting anymore. So the most recent study I saw was published just last year, uh, and in this study, they went into actual classrooms and they were there for 15 weeks. They studied the effect of decorations over 15 weeks which is a very substantial portion of any academic year. That's, that's a, at least a term, sometimes more. Um, and what they were looking for is quote unquote habituation. The question is, do the decorations become part of the student's mental habit so they're no longer disoriented by them? And the answer to the question was no, no evidence of habituation was observed. Uh, so even over the span of 15 weeks, distractions are distractions. Um, so in parent world, I think what that means is paying very close attention to the environment in which your children are studying really does matter. Um, so if the room has a lot of, if they're studying in their bedroom, well, how disorienting is the stuff in the bedroom? If it's disorienting, then don't have them study there. Is there a dog that's disorienting them? Is there music that's disorienting them? Is there a sibling that's disorienting them? Uh, are they hungry? <laughs> if they're hungry, they're going to be disoriented by their hunger. So helping children see all of the different ways th that they might be disoriented um, and doing our best parental thing in order to minimize those disorienting problems, uh, that can be highly helpful. The second most common question that I got has to do with technology. <clears throat> So let me quit out of that for just a moment and say the following thing about technology. So I had two things to say about the way that technology can um, disorient us. The first thing to say is, in my experience, what tends to happen is we perceive that there are teams that you can be on. And one team over here says, um, technology is distracting and disorienting our children, and we must banish it from here and banish it from there and minimize it as much as possible. And the other team says that more or less by definition, technology is the way of the future and children need to embrace technology and families need to uh, participate in that technology as much as possible and we need to be all in on technology. And we tend to, to move quickly to one of those positions and stay on those teams. And my own thinking, is as much as possible, instead of making team decisions, make very specific and granular decisions. So if someone comes to the school and says, well, you know, this program on the iPad helps third graders learn multiplication really well. So I would want to investigate whether or not it's true that this particular program on the iPod helps my iPad, helps my third graders learn multiplication. Uh, and if the pros outweigh the cons, well, then probably I'll go with it, especially if I can minimize the cons as much as possible. But it's also possible there will be more cons than pros, in which case I won't. But I didn't make a decision about technology generally. I made a decision about using this particular technology for this particular thing with these particular students and, and to make one by one decisions about technology. Um, so my first thing to say is, is rather than being on a team and saying embrace it all or reject it all, to make very specific decisions within a very specific context. And Barbara heard me say this all day today about other teaching philosophies. The second point that I would make about technology, and, and I feel this very strongly, so I will say this emphatically, 
What I wanna say is you are the parent. You get to decide. You don't need research to support your parenting decision about what is best for your family. So if you think that cell phones are interfering with your family life in a particular way, you get to ban them because you're the parent and you don't need research to say so. You don't need to. And if you as the parent think that the cell phones are good for the thing and the thing and the thing and you want your children to have cell phones, you're the parent, you get to say that, you don't need research. And my experience is that people tend to find research that supports their opinion and say, well, look, the research shows this and therefore I'm going to do it. And, and I, I, hesitate, I don't hesitate to say, I will say directly, <clears throat> often that happens at the expense of a nuanced understanding of what the research actually says. So you, really, you genuinely don't need research to support your parenting decision. You're the parent, you get to decide. And I'm happy to talk with you about individual granular decisions if you wanna send me an email. Um, but you're the parent, you decide. <clears throat> okay, so these, Barbara, is my screen back up? Okay, good. Okay. So those were the two big points I wanted to make about technology decisions. Don't have a big decision, yes or no, all in, all out. Uh, and you get to make the decision you want because you're the parent and you know the child better than anybody else. <clears throat> okay, so we have moderated alertness levels by, say, using movement. We have reduced the salience of all the distractors by encouraging our students, our children, to study in places that are as undistracting as possible. So how do we increase the salience of what it is that our students are, what our children are learning? Uh, and in this case, I think the teacher answer to that question and the parent answer to that question are two very different things. And I've been thinking about the best way to say this. So here is, I think, the best thing that parents can do here, because truthfully, this is the teacher's job. It's the teacher's job to help the child focus it on what it is that they're supposed to be learning. And as the parent, that's harder for you to do because you're not there when they're learning it. So how would you do that? So I think the best thing you can do is to focus on this question with your children. Well, what did you learn? And that sounds like an incredibly mundane, uh, you know, of course you're going to ask that. Who wouldn't answer, ask that question? But the key thing to listen to in the answer is, well, is what it is, is what the child says she learned, what it is likely that the teacher was in fact wanting to teach. So I'll give you an example. Let's say your child is in, um, in a has a geology unit right now. So the teacher is teaching the geology unit and the, the topic is about volcanoes. Uh, and to make the topic of volcanoes interesting, the teacher starts with a story about Vesuvius and I'm blanking on the name of the town that was covered by Ash. Barbara, you can help me and remember. Uh, Vesuvius covers the town. I can't think of what it's called. doesn't matter. Um, so the, oops, somebody, somebody's telling me, I'm very excited. Pompeii, thank you, Barbara is my favorite. <clears throat> so yes, um, this, the teacher starts with the story of Vesuvius and Pompeii. So if you say to your child, what did you learn today? And the child says, oh, we heard this totally cool story about this volcano that buried this, this Roman town and this cool stuff happened. You might think to yourself, well, wait a minute, this was in the geology unit so it seems actually really unlikely to me that the teacher wanted the child to learn about Vesuvius. The teacher wanted the child to learn about the geological forces that cause volcanoes to happen. And that particular topic got lost in the cool stuff about um, Vesuvius and Pompeii. So ask the question and listen to the answer and see if the answer sounds like actually what it is that the teacher wanted the student to learn. So if your child uh, just had a unit about, say, the Harlem Renaissance, and the final project is to make a poster, and you say, well, what did you learn about the Harlem Renaissance? And the child says, well, what I learned is that the glue stick is better than the Elmer's. Well, yes, when, when he created the poster, maybe the glue stick was better than the Elmer's, but that's actually almost certainly not what the teacher wanted the student to learn about the Harlem Renaissance. That wasn't the goal. The goal was something about the Harlem Renaissance. So it seemed like a mundane question 
But if when you ask the question, you're listening to, well, is this what the, what the teacher wanted my child to learn? And asking follow-up questions and bringing them around to that, you can help orient your child to what it is that the learning goal actually was. And you're having to do a little nimble thinking there and sort of trying to see past the screen of what your child says she learned to what it is that the teacher was actually teaching. But I'm going to guess most parents are going to be pretty savvy about how to do that. Okay. Ooh, my clicker is fighting back. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so we've helped our student with alertness. We've helped our uh, student and our children with orienting. What about executive attention? Uh, and there's a very long answer to this question, but I think the short answer to the question is simply to say, students have trouble with executive attention processes, which is to say they have trouble controlling their cognitive processes when the problem that they're facing is too complicated for them to think about right now, the cognitive load, is too high. So I'll give an example of this. You will remember just a few minutes ago, um, I asked Barbara um, to tell me what part of speech the word poodle is in this sentence, and she gave me the wrong answer. She, she said it was a metaphor. So I think there are a couple of problems going on here. So the first is, when I asked Barbara what part of speech this was, because I'm an English teacher, part of speech is actually a really clear category to me that's not hard to do. Uh, and maybe at some point, Barbara will know parts of speech well enough to answer that confidently. But I think the question that Barbara probably heard is, what word that we use in English fits right now? And there are probably a couple hundred words that fit in an English class. So Barbara could say symbolism, or she could say protagonist, or she could say Shakespeare, or she, she could say Steinbeck. Like, all of those words sound right in an English class. And if she's not confident, she's just going to randomly grab and see if she can come up with some word that sounds right in this context. So one really easy way to reduce the cognitive load at this moment, like she's got to think about a couple hundred words. That's far too many words. So if you simply start by writing down what the parts of speech are, well, now Barbara doesn't have to think about a hundred words. She only has to decide, well, which of these eight words is the correct answer? So the cognitive load has vastly reduced right there because this is a much simpler question, not which one of these hundred words is correct, but which of these eight words is correct. The second strategy I think we could do to reduce the cognitive load is to notice that actually poodle is probably not a helpful question for me to be asking at this moment because poodle is a very exceptional, it, it's being used in a very unusual, exceptional way. It's almost never true that poodle uh, is an adjective. So if instead of asking Barbara what part of speech is the word poodle, I asked her what part of speech is the word uh, what part of speech is the word new, well, it's much likelier she will be able to effortfully control her cognitive processes because she doesn't need to be thinking about quirky exceptions. She just needs to be understanding it at an initial level. Uh, and especially if I have helpfully provided what all the potential answers are. The combination of asking a fairly straightforward question within limited parameters, I'm reducing the cognitive load so that she's much likelier to be able to succeed. Now, of course, the ultimate goal of all of this is I would like at some point within the next several weeks or months for her to be able to answer the exceptional question and to answer it without that word list there. But what I just noticed is when I asked the question in the original way, the answer that I got showed an executive attention problem, which is to say it showed that the working memory load, the cognitive load was too high, uh, and that's why I got the wrong answer that I got. By the way, the reason I told you at the beginning that you didn't have to take any notes because I was gonna, I was gonna put all the answers on one page was if you're taking notes, that's actually increasing the cognitive load that you're experiencing right now. So I was sneakily trying to reduce the cognitive load that you're experiencing. I wanted you just to focus without having to write. Um, so when I show you that one page, uh, you'll have all the information and the cognitive load will have been lower the whole time. So <clears throat> if uh, I get my students' alertness level to the right place with, say, movement and visual novelty, and if I help them orient by reducing all the distractions uh, and, and keeping a relentless focus on what is it did you learn and is it what the teacher wanted you to learn, and if I help them with their executive attention processes uh, by managing the cognitive load, the overall result of that is likely to be a, a child who can pay attention. 
If you are interested in this set of questions that I've been talking about, the first book, uh, Barbara very kindly listed all my books. The first, the first of the three books called Learning Begins uh, is about working memory and attention. And by the way, working memory here is the same thing as cognitive load that I was just talking about. So if you're interested in this particular set of questions, uh, that would be the next book to follow up on. Okay, I promised that I was going to put all of the information I wanted to share on one slide. So there it is. So if you want to go ahead and take a screenshot of that slide, or if you want to take a picture of that slide, uh, all of the core ideas that I wanted to focus on are there. Uh, so you don't need to have been taking notes. It's all, it's all right there. So I will let people take pictures and screenshots and so forth. And I'm going to be quiet for just a little while. I assume that people have questions and I'm going to let you pop your questions into the chat. And then Barbara is going to be moderating the questions. So much, Andrew. That presentation was wonderful, and I think it did answer a lot of the questions that were kindly sent in by our attendees uh, on our uh, Google form for sign up. Um, I think you really addressed the attention um, issues surrounding ADHD, as well as your kind of standard rule that is the parents' good judgment surrounding screens and laptops. We did have just one specific question there that maybe to give an example of what you think about um, what you would what your expectations would be for an average eight year old. Let me focus on the question this way. So um, averages are a really interesting question in school world. So Barbara has heard me say 20 times today uh, that averages are important, but no child is average. And what that means in school is that it's helpful for us to know what an average child can do and then to be able to respond around the range of average. We're going to teach roughly to somewhere in the average range, but I need to be able to respond to the student who needs more support. I need to be able to respond to the student who needs more challenge. Um, that's how a, how a school is going to respond to averages. I actually think parents respond very differently to averages because your child isn't average. You don't need to know what average eight-year-olds are like. You need to know what your eight-year-old is like, and you need to manage what your eight-year-old is like. Um, and because your eight-year-old, I promise you, it's not just you being an adoring parent, it's just true. Nobody else in the world is like your eight-year-old. Your eight-year-old is your eight-year-old. So for each of those things, what are your uh, sort of alertness parameters for your particular eight-year-old? What are the sorts of things that disorient and orient your eight-year-old? Uh, what are the sorts of things that overwhelm your eight-year-old's um, executive attention capabilities? That's going to be a very particular thing. And you as a parent will know how to do that and know what those parameters are better than others will. Um, one of the... Um, Another thing that Barbara has heard me say several times today um, is don't do this thing, think this way. I get very suspicious when people like me, people who are consultants, use averages to give teaching advice, or in this case, parenting advice, uh, that's highly prescriptive um, because the averages are important, but your family isn't average, your child isn't average, you aren't average. So... Uh, I think that's my first my first pass at answering that question. The next question is, where do you see relationships such as student, teacher, parent, child relationships fitting into the mix of attention? In other words, how can we leverage relationships to help our students learn? So certainly in the classroom, relationships are most important at the place of orienting, which is to say, I think it's incredibly unlikely that my students orient to grammar because they are in fact intrinsically in, interested in grammar. Very, very few human beings on the planet are intrinsically interested in grammar. They're just not. Uh, relatively few students are intrinsically interested in Shakespeare. It, it makes me sad to say that, but it's just true. They're, they're just not. Uh, honestly, nobody in the world wants to calculate the area under a curve. Exactly two, two people in all of history figured out how to do that. People just aren't intrinsically interested in these sorts of things. Um, and one of the many things that teachers can do to help students orient to them is if I have a good relationship with my student, I can sort of use that to bring them around to the grammar. They're not really into the grammar, but if the two of us get along well and I know how to joke with them well enough, uh, I can sort of bring them around and say, okay, now please join me in orienting over here. It's one of the one of the surprising pieces, I don't know if parents know this, uh, maybe, but I don't know, is 
in my experience, most teachers want to teach a very particular age range and would feel completely helpless anywhere else. So I really like teaching high school sophomores, juniors, seniors. I feel a little fish out of water with ninth graders and middle school baffles me completely. And I would be terrified, terrified, like teaching second grade. I got nothing. I got nothing. And I think part of that is I'm actually pretty good. I kind of get 15 year olds. And I realize that's an odd thing to say, but I, I sort of, I connect well with them. And because we tend to have good relationships together, I'm able to get them around and say, okay, it's time to talk about Macbeth. And then they say, mm -hmm, and then we talk about Macbeth. So I think uh, relationships is a very important thing uh, in the world of helping students orient. Another one of our attendees has asked, so if a decorated classroom is a problem, how about a disorganized home? I know none of us on this call have that, but there's the question. <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, all of those things that disorient people in classrooms will, will disorient people at home. So I think um, often in the world of education, the word traditional has a bad valence to it, uh, that if it's, if it's the way we used to do it, then it's definitely a bad thing. Um, but traditionally, we used to encourage students to study in libraries um, <clears throat> because for the most part, libraries tend to be quiet and visually fairly bland, which is to say there's not a lot that's disorienting them. It's kind of great. Uh, and that doesn't mean you have to require your child to study in the library, but your, your children are much less likely to be disoriented if the dog isn't with them at the time, or if they're not in a room that has lots of music playing, or if they're not watching YouTube at the same time, or if their brother isn't pestering them about, no, it's your turn to do the chores or whatever it is. So I think one of the most specific, concrete, useful things that parents can do uh, to help children pay attention is by reducing all of the disorienting stuff at home. A question for students who are often distracted disruptive for whatever reason, is there any sort of discipline, and discipline is in quotes, that is effective or are all the concepts you have presented to us today essentially a form of effective discipline? Is the problem, oh. the, is the problem that teachers expect students to sit down and be quiet when if we are engaging them, they will want to figuratively stand up and communicate? I'm not 100% not sure on that last little couple of lines there. Yeah, so wow, there's a lot packed into that question, isn't there? So I love the idea that if I'm teaching in such a way <clears throat> as to take account of alertness and orienting and executive attention, simply by managing those things, I'm more or less managing misbehavior out of the classroom. Um, I think that's actually largely true. Schools often reach out to me uh, and say, we're changing from a 45-minute from a period to a 90-minute period can you come and help my teachers understand how to teach well in 90 minutes? Or sometimes they'll say, can you tell me what the research shows about the best length of time for a class? And in both cases, I say, well, what you really want to talk about is attention, because if you understand how attention works, then you can work effectively in any length of time. So Barbara watched me teach today for six hours, more or less consecutively. Uh, and I think, Barbara, am I, am I wrong? I think people were pretty well paying attention for six hours because I know enough about how attention works that um, we take a lot of breaks. <laughs> uh, when I'm teaching for long chunks of time, I, I need to let them stand up and walk around. I actually require them to stand up and walk around because if I didn't, their alertness levels would plummet. Um, there's a, I show a lot of videos when I teach because it's really good for alertness. Um, so all of those things that I talk about people, other people using uh, I myself use them because they really do help. Um, there is such a thing as misbehavior. There are such things as behavior strategies and so forth. Those are much less my area of expertise. So for the same reasons, I'm not going to say a lot about ADHD. I don't want to say too much about behavior because it's not something I really focus on. And I, I don't know that research pool uh, much at all. I guess the book that I know of that has gotten the most attention in the world of behavior for teachers uh, is written by a guy named Tom Bennett and it's called Running the Room, R-U-N-N-I-N-G, Running the Room. Uh, I myself have only read a small piece of it, but people I respect say it's a great book. So if you're really interested in that, uh, you might look at that. I, I should tell you, uh, he's a British writer and he has a very particular perspective. 
So you might not jam, you might not love his jam, uh, and he's certainly talking about a somewhat different school world. Um, those are our last questions that we have, Andrew. Um, if anyone else wants to pop a question in before we go, while while I'm waiting for that, I will just mention um, the YouTube channel for the Teaching Fellows Institute is linked in the chat room. And if you click on that link and you subscribe to it and then hit the bell, I think you have to both subscribe and hit the bell. And with that, we will thank Andrew so very much. Lots of great comments in the chat box uh, for all your things. And thank you all for being here and being interested in this topic. Very, very much appreciate your interest. With that, great. thanks so much, night. everyone. And we'll hopefully see you again next year for our next parent talk. Bye-bye now. Thank you.